welcome Bernd. He's going to tell us a little bit how convenience is killing open standards. Yeah, good evening. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is, um, is Bernd. Um, I give a little bit of introduction who I am and what I do. So I'm working as CEO for a company named Netways in Nuremberg and also um, for the open source monitoring product named Isinga. Um, I'm heavily involved in the DevOps days movement. Um, obviously, because of, of COVID-19, there are pretty much no events going on, actually. But in, usually, I'm, I'm, I'm really try to visit a lot of places and, and, and join DevOps days there. Um, yeah, I do this talk in English. Obviously, I have a little bit of a Franconian accent, which is uh, related to uh, Nuremberg, of course. And if you would like to get in touch with me, um, Twitter definitely would be the, the best one. Um, so yeah, just to give you a little bit of my background, where I'm coming from, which perhaps makes uh, hopefully sense in some way for you what, why the topic is important to me. So I started my IT career at the end of the 90s um, as a Solaris admin um, at a company named Quelle. The older ones of you know that still was a big retailer in, in Germany and Europe as well. Um, at some point, I came into uh, the Oracle business, which primarily the reason was I think I was the, the slowest person to hide when they asked for somebody who was able to do the Oracle training. So I was into that and started um, doing Oracle. And um, I did that for over seven years, um, did Oracle consulting and traveled pretty much um, yeah, Europe and, and Germany mainly. And then I ended up uh, in an open source company which is NetWays, which I'm still there for over 12, 13 years now. Um, and so that the different perspectives I had in, in the different industries, uh, I think are one of the reasons why I'm in some way worried about where we're heading as an industry and, and pretty much also um, how my topic comes together. So yeah, there's a, a pretty high chance I will retire there um, because I really like it there. Um, it's still overseeable team. And um, I really like the job I'm doing, and it's one of the biggest privileges you can have, I think. Um, yeah, so the motivation for the talk. Um, so when you think about your own and think, okay, what, what, what catches me when I think about this topic? I think one thing is that I'm old, which um, means I'm old is, is 43 years old, which is perhaps not super old, but it's old enough that you that you see that our industry comes back to every wave and every hype every now and then. So we have a very short term memory in our industry that we usually when a new hype curve and a new thing comes up, we, we tend to forget everything we learned before. Um, so that's one thing when I'm looking back to, let's say now 25 years in that industry, I've seen a lot of things. Um, I would not say that I understand everything, but you could kind of an idea how the industry in some way works. Um, of course, I'm still curious. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, even I'm, nowadays, I'm not so much involved in the technical stuff um, from the from the project doing aspect, but I'm still very interested in technology, um, but also more on the level where where the industry is going and and how different business models come together in that way. So I'm still very interested in, in try to understand where we where we're heading. So of course, we would like to do something great, and that is something that never changed. Um, so when, when I started my career in IT, there was pretty much two vendors we were working with still in, in, in my shop at this time, there was also a big IBM shop for the, for the whole host world. But we, at the time we were the totally newbies coming with, with Unix, um, systems like Sun and HPX. We were for the, for the host people, we were the very, yeah, unserious, uh, play dudes and uh, they really didn't take us serious. And, and at the time we had pretty much Sun Microsystems and, and HPX, um, so hard and software. Um, so in, I was mainly in the, in the Sun team and we did big warehousings with E10Ks and all that stuff. It was at the first time when I, I saw that machine, I was very disappointed because it was just a terminal and, and coming from Windows because I, that is what I used for gaming and something when I was young. I was very disappointed that there are machines for millions of, of dollars and you pretty much see just a couple of text terminals. But anyway, it didn't take long that it really catches me. I like the system. Um, but we were very limited to the to the vendors we can choose from. 
So um, at the time, the department I was working in, we had big goals to achieve. So we would like to start with a with a web shop at the time. That was a new thing, a new project. They would start on that on that systems with Solaris and all that stuff. So we had a lot of stuff to do. And um, what we did is that we, we made a lot of architecture stuff, how we can build that system. So at the time there was no identity system, there was no central file sharing. So we came up with something like, like NIST network information service at the time, which was um, at the time was very cool. Um, I don't know if somebody is still using this. Um, so we make a lot of pick, uh, a lot of architectural designs how we can grow our Solaris and also HPX landscape. But the promises which were made um, by the vendors we had, and that was one of the problems that we had a very limited um, software pool which we can choose from. So every time we said we need a web server or we need a database server or we need some, I don't know, proxy or whatever architecture we tried to play out. Every time I remember we were in a meeting with usually somebody from Oracle or sometimes from, from some microsystems or any like software vendor at the time. And that it was always the same thing like, um, yeah, of course we have some software. So we have some whatever suit uh, which you can use. And at the beginning, we were very happy. We said, That's fantastic. We have something to achieve and, and there's a software. Um, but even when we, when we hoped so, this is where we ended up. So going back to slides, so we plan it this way. It takes a little bit into the stream until the picture comes up. Um, so we want to do it this way, but with the tools and the solutions they promised us, we usually ended up like in a total nightmare that the software didn't work and we had to install some patches and, and worked around that stuff a lot um, to get it working. Um, so it, it was really it was really frustrating in some way. Um, because every time the supposed improvements made it worse. So every time when we get a new version of something, because of course we had to wait for it because it was not open source in some way. So the um, the companies promised something. Every time it was really worse. And I don't know if if you are speaking German, you know that of of course it, it for Schlimber Salon. That was the typical thing where we ended up. So every time we tried to improve it, it was it was even more horrible afterwards. So it was super frustrating at some point because we were very limited. We had a very controlled hardware stack, but I have to say the hardware itself didn't make any problems. And also the operating system was not a big deal because it was still the POSIX standard and there was some kind of um, freedom, um, but that there was pretty much no software we could use. And this was so closed and we had no impact and we couldn't see it and was intransparent. It was very frustrating. So. One of the things at the time came up and, and was almost there was that in some way there were standards uh, made it possible to achieve more. And uh, one thing is the, the POSIX standard, which was at the time and all the Unix systems over there in POSIX is defined, for example, that you have an uh, NVI in place, um, that you have SED or all these basic tools and fundamentally APIs of the operating system were defined in the POSIX standards. And it made it possible in some way to to interchange and, and open something um, which was new to us um, because it brought a change. Because what, what for us POSIX um, open up that, that the GNU tools come in place. And the GNU tools at some point were for me at the time and also for my colleagues, the first thing where we can use tools which were open source so we can have a look on the source code. It was done by somebody else. And even the feedback loop was way more faster in that in that community than we had with our million dollar um, software vendors. Um, so that was super exciting that we we get way more options to choose to build our platform. Um, also Linux started at the time. Um, so Linux started pretty close to where the company was in, in Ferdin Bavaria. And, and the older ones of you remember these big boxes with a lot of CDs and um, I remember when our colleague at the time started with Linux and um, he pretty much spent weeks compiling the kernel and, and including the right modules and we pretty much treat him the same way like the host dudes did, treated us. And we are saying, this is really not a serious system. You will never make it um, to production. Um, we ended up at the time that the, the Procord Solaris system we bought to run the web shop 
it was pretty much running CT at home and uh, listening to a space for any other thing. And the production web server was running on a Linux box under his desk. So this is where we ended up. And this was also the, the way when I, I came into the Linux business in some way. So it was fantastic because if you remember that the old Linux CDs, you had so many tools, it was so option. So it was really mind blowing how much stuff you can do. Um, and you had communities. So the first time for me at the time, it was, you had the feeling that there is more than just a limited vendor offering. So there are other people fighting the same problems and um, try to find the best solution for them. And it was really, it was also big diversity. Um, it was just fantastic. So we were really motivated. I can remember that even in, in our team at the time, um, more and more Linux come into it. And we were also allowed to use more open source tools in some way was was really fantastic. So time flies. Um, a lot happened in the time. So open source is, of course, more than ever. Um, so where we are, I think, in, in my opinion, and that, that I don't know, short or, or 16 minute, whatever history would like to, to set the foundation for where I see where we are is an IT landscape currently. Perhaps it's not so worse than the picture is showing and we are not drawing completely. Um, but means what happened is in the last in, in the last decade, I would say, that really changed the whole open source landscape. Um, things like Microsoft loves Linux, which is it's fine, it's it's great, but still going back 10 to 15 years, it's it's really hard to imagine that where Microsoft is now, and they're doing, I think, in most of the business cases, doing really fantastic, um, it was really hard to imagine. So the landscape and, and the vendors and the big players in that game where we are now changed dramatically, of course, because IT landscape changed dramatically. Um, and I would never expect that if you ask me that 10, 15 years ago. Um, so we have more open source than ever. Uh, if it is on GitHub or GitLab or wherever your favorite system, we have a lot of open source. So open source is produced on a day-to-day -day basis. You can pretty much um, get information about anything, a lot of communities. Um, we have a changing market, um, which is the cloud report is a little bit outdated, let's like, say six to seven months, but what we can see the numbers and kind of still true. So what we see, um, is that the on-premise business um, is going to be reduced in a way that more and more companies and people go to a public, in some way, perhaps hybrid cloud module. But of course, it's it's not overseeable that, that many, many companies move their business into an AWS, an Azure, Google Cloud, or other vendors. So that's the trend. And I think it's pretty much no surprise that this will not change in the next year, uh, next years. It would definitely surprise me, but I think the trend is clear that people more and more give up on their on-premise IT infrastructure and um, move their services into any, any kind of cloud system. Um, so where's the problem? So where's the problem in, in, in the thing that, that people move their, their business around and going to, uh, to the public cloud providers? I think one thing is that we often have a mismatch between open source and open standards. So the problem is that um, we have, um, like I said before, we have more open source than ever, but um, open standards really is a thing. And um, the problem is that there are often a mismatch is that an API is not an open standard. So most of the providers out there, they have the API, sometimes their API became kind of a standard. Think about the S3, for example, which AWS in some way brought up and then there are other things like you can have like a Rudders gateway for your Ceph cluster and pretty much speak the same, um, use it like in the same interface. So there are APIs became kind of standards, um, but most of the things we see out there um, are not standardized in any way that um, they, ha they have some. Um, we have also in the cloud environment, you have standards like the OCI, open cloud interface and all that stuff but pretty much nobody really knows them or deals with them. So that's that's something which is really different um, what we see now that, that, that companies promote, we have an API, but more and more everything they do behind um, is of course hidden behind that API. And of course the API is usually not an open standard. 
So we have a very unbalanced market. Um, and if you remember uh, the first picture with I, which I had um, with uh, Solaris and HPX on top, which is pretty much not a real picture, the picture you're seeing now is a real picture. So this is like Seattle Tacoma Airport, um, where um, employees of the named companies have primary access to that um, to the gateways. And this is the market where we're seeing right now that pretty much the big players in that business more and more put all the others on the side. But with that, that they control the majority of services and see it as like storage or compute, pretty much more and more companies and enterprises go into their systems. They also control more and more of the internet um, because they own the highway, right? If you drive on their streets, they control who is first and who is last. And and that, that worries me a little bit, that we have a very unbalanced market. Um, and, and this is just, just to explain it in more detail. We have, at the end, we have three big players in that market. Um, Azure was doing way better in the last years from the growth rate like AWS was, which I don't know the reasons. I assume that, that Microsoft still has the um, way more better connections into enterprises from the sales perspectives, but they were able to grow massively. Then we have Google. Then of course we have some others, IBM, and, and we have Alibaba, which is perhaps regional limited, of course. But we see that that pretty much we end up like 70, 80% of the public cloud will be um, in the hand of uh, three companies, which is in some way honestly worries me because, um, yeah, again, we have no standards. They have it, they have the API, they own it, they control it. Um, and I think that's not a good thing. Um, one thing is, and this is something we can see because there is no real open standard tools like terraform uh, for instance that's one of the reasons why they are so successful because terraform if you don't know it terraform is kind of a declarative way to sub to describe your it infrastructure and then you can run it um, against multiple cloud providers or even your, like your local open stack or vmware so terraform is uh, the most popular config management tool out there because it gives people a way to abstract their non-standardized cloud API in a way that they can describe it with the HashiCorp language. And um, I think that's one of the reasons, but because we don't have really an open standard and we have to decide on one thing and there's a lot of articles and blog posts and books about it. What is the right decision? If you go all in and say, we go with AWS or we go with Google Cloud and we, we try to to keep out that multi-cloud layer, which is of course, it's perhaps more work because also like a Terraform environment cannot go from AWS to Google Cloud without modifying it. So we have to take care of multiple vendors. So it's it's a tough question if you if you if your strategy is cloud in, um, if you do it, if you really have a multi-vendor strategy and a lot of people just skip it and say, we, we go all in with one vendor because it's simpler. We don't have to take care about the other um, specific um, requirements and limitations, and it's just easier for us. But the impact on open source, in my opinion, um, is is really big. Because one thing is that um, what happens is that the cloud providers we see take more and more open source out of that ecosystem. Um, some of them give money back, like Google does, for instance, if you buy an, buy an Elastic stack um, at Google, they have like a back contract with Elastic to give them money and you can open up a ticket in a single interface, whatever it is, but they try to, to work together with the producing industry and the other companies who don't. So they take out the open source software, sometimes modify it, sometimes not, make their business on top of it, but not contributing back, which is a big, big problem because it ends up uh, in fear and protection because what other open source companies do, and this is something we see right now, like Redis did it, they try to protect their property because for a lot of open source companies, I would say the 90% plus, this, the typical business model is usually having an open source, like open core, whatever you name it, but it's pretty much the same that it's, some things you can buy when you give them money. Right? We have some enterprise feature or some clustering and you give them extra money, then you get enterprise, you get support. 
And this is how an open source company can make money because they have um, pay their people. But for an open source company, that changes dramatically. If if like an Amazon take um, and we take keep that example with Redis, for instance, take that open source software and sell it. Um, there is no revenue stream back to the producers of that software, and that's a problem. And so Redis, for example, came up with new licenses and said, okay, we have a license that you use in a SaaS environment, you cannot use specific modules. So they they did it modifying the licenses, which I also think is not a good idea that we come up with more and more licenses because if you ever have to deal with open source licensing, it's complicated enough. Um, so do, we don't need more um, going into that business. So that's I think that's a bad situation and that's some market situation also we see currently that more and more companies don't know how to move forward with this. Um, the new licenses, yeah, I said it already. So in some way, one concern I have is that open source and open standards in some way need support. Um, if it's like a, a one person project, if it's like a, a side project, which a company has, in some way, everybody needs a funding for his resources, in some way to, to pay his own bills. And, and the, the change of the market that pretty much most of the people who produce software, especially in open source, they don't have access to their customer anymore. And and since a lot of the big players in that game, like Amazon are so big, they have no requirement um, that they need the engineering, engineering capability of the of the original creators of the software. So they, they really cut the whole revenue stream down um, to that uh, to that people, which which is something I think um it bites us because we will end up in having a more uh, unflexible industry in this way and for the other ones um it's really hard to also survive then with an open source business model in some way because the revenue stream is cut up when in let's say three to four years with the 80 percent of the people are running on on cloud services so where's the future in that or where's the leading us honestly i don't know because i don't have this crystal ball but I think we are in some ways still just at the beginning. So this all came into place with infrastructure, the service and platform and services. And now we see um, function as a service more and more. So the big providers have their function infrastructure where you, you don't have to deal with your virtual machines or your storage, you just call functions to, I don't know, store or analyze pictures or just write something into the queue, which are very, very hard to be abstract. So if you build your application on a function as a service platform of Amazon, it's really, really hard to transform it and put it somewhere else. So you go into a full vendor lock-in, which is a risk you can take, but it's anyway, it's it's a risk. There are some um, open source alternatives away, like OpenFast. So there are some open source function as a service, but what I see a lot of big industries and enterprises um, go more and more in a way that they use public available functions as a service at one of these providers and also committing um, to a full login to the platform, which is I'm always wondering because I was one of the big things when it was about like procurement, what platform are we choosing, how we move forward with IT architecture. One of the big things was like, how can we prevent vendor login? That was always a big thing. So how can we stay flexible as a company? How if we don't like to work with them anymore or they don't work, like to work with us anymore? So wh what are our changes to do something else? That was always, um, we were always worried about the thing. And I I'm still am. So every day, if if we are in, in, a, in a position where we have to decide for something and how we move forward, I always try to, to think about if that doesn't work, what can I do? Where are my alternatives? And I'm honestly really wondering why this, in some way, in, in my opinion, priority um, is, is not a big thing anymore, or for a lot of people, it's not a thing anymore. Um, so the question is, is it all worse? Perhaps is it, um, because that's an argument, if you talk to people in, 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 in real life, or you have a conversation about it, um, that people say, perhaps this is how it is. This is um, how the industry moves forward and, and um, we have to live with it. And perhaps that's also true. So I think that's not all bad. In some way, 
of course it makes no sense for everyone to build a data center so i think in that in that world we currently having that we have in some way access to a lot of resources also in a flexible way is of course an achievement so it's not all bad but um it's a risk um it's it's a risk if you for the for the price of convenience to go into a full vendor login as a company even usually it's super hard to identify what you have to pay for it um, because that usually can nobody tell you except you get the first bill to pay um, it's a risk um, lock-in is a risk so even if you see it from the IT perspective or from renting out your office and you cannot go out if you have to if you log in for a decision making process and especially if you're an IT driven company um, of course, it's a risk if you have to stay with someone and build your platform based on function as a services which are provided by the vendor, and it's super hard for you to go somewhere else. But of course, loneliness is a risk too. I get that argument totally when people say, "I have a great startup idea. I would like to be, I would like to be on the market very quick." And and the the need for speed in our industry changed dramatically in the last years. I totally get it that people cannot cannot wait like for a year and build the engineering team and buy their own rent their own colo space and build their it stuff they will use like whatever favorite um open source uh, not open source public cloud system they can use and get and start with the application so of course it's it's like um, a thing you have to think about what is important for your business um what we see also is that the cost thing is really um something um where people take care most. So that's the number one priority. And this is crazy how many companies build their whole business model around how to save cloud costs. Um, um, that's that's really crazy because people figure out that, of course, resources you use on an everyday basis, especially if you're not able to scale them up or down, going to be crazy expensive. No wonder because these other enterprises need to run machines as well. Um, and, and another thing which comes up and this is something we see in some areas, but not so much still, that I'm a little bit wondered that if the whole market is controlled by three to four big vendors, we have an, an oligopoly which, which happens there. So take another example. When we talk about an insulin, which is perhaps, it's a little bit far away as an example to IT resources. But the thing is in 2006, a dose of insulin cost about $67 roundabout there are different vendors and different companies in 2019 it was about 285 even the production of insulin itself got to be cheaper and cheaper over the over the years but the problem is that there are only three to four vendors who are selling insulin and they totally control the market um, and even perhaps you cannot compare um, the dose of insulin price to um, cloud resource offering right now but imagine um the world will end up in having three to four windows where you are able to buy it resources and also get in some way and i think this is something we will see in the next years they when they will control the access to that highway um the the access to the to the highway to the internet which was still right now controlled decentralized will be more and more limited with their own protocols and own stuff and I guess we will see that in pricing as well, because if just a couple of vendors control it, it's not it's not a law of IT. It's a lot of a law of economy that 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 pricing with a little bit vendors they have no benefit and like going to be cheaper. Um, I think this is interesting. Um, the future will show if I'm right. I'm wrong with that example, but anyway, um, I can do it. And there's another example like Nestle, which is very popular i don't know if popular is the right word for it like buying water resources all over the world and pumping out waters like crazy and then selling it to a crazy amount of price selling people back so because they control pretty much pretty much of the market it's totally up to them to create pricing structure and and that's just like two examples um water is a good example and if you see now water is a fundamentally problem we see now around the world that people don't have access to water and there are companies like Nestle sitting on water in South Africa and, and pumping um, whole um, villages empty and then selling the bottle for 50 cents, which is a lot of money for them. So this is the same in some way, the same way 
market movement I, I think we see here. Perhaps it's not comparable 100%, but I think the, the economic story is the same. So the abuse of power um, comes as no surprise. So if, if, if just the limited pool of companies controls that IT market, IT resources, um, they in some way will lead to abuse, which sometimes it already does. Um, but that's, that's something which, which is no surprise to me. Um, government impact, of course, is something. It means that's, that's a picture of, um, of the German Bundestag, but um, means right now the situation what we have is that, that 70, 80% um, of that public cloud resources is under control by an American government um, which of course you can you can doubt you can different you can have different perspectives on politics which is not the topic of my talk but in some way it's crazy um, because we as Europe missed it to be to be part in that game um, but the whole that that whole industry pretty much ends up to be controlled um, by a single government and I think that could not be in in any other's interest and I I don't get it why why German companies or like state companies um, go into public cloud, um, which is totally under control by other system and they use the control. Um, so this is an example. Um, you see that the Chiba, which is in Venezuela, when it's just, just an example, last year there was an, an act against Venezuela that from one day to another, um, companies and agencies in Venezuela, we are not able to use um, any public cloud offering which the United States companies offered. They were not able to use it from one day to another. So there was an act came in place. And for example, Adobe, they have their accounts in there. And I, I, there's an article, I, it's, it's also linked in the blog, in the, um, in the presentation. Um, from one day to another, they were not able to access the documents because by that act, they were not allowed um, to grant any company in Venezuela access to the data. And in my opinion, that's that's totally nuts. Um, but this is a situation where we are right now. So what can you do? Or what is, what is perhaps my point in this? I think perhaps it makes sense to not follow every hype. And I'm not saying that public cloud is a hype uh, because it's definitely more than this because it's a change of our industry. Um, but it perhaps always makes sense to think about is it really something what we need? Is it really something um, we should go all in with? Um, there was a, a tweet by, by Kelsey Hightower a couple of months ago already when he said monoliths are the future. It means Kelsey, for example, is one of them who promoted a lot of that microservice art architecture. And there are tons of articles out there like Uber or big enterprises. They pretty much cut their whole applications into pieces and have like hundreds or thousands of microservices and that totally went pretty much out of control. And now they now try to gain control back in, in building more monolithic systems again. So, and that's also, that's something of the IT industry we have that every now and then that we go everything to big machines then smaller machines and that's the landscape will always change. And sometimes if you have the feeling that you miss a hype train, um, you figure out that the next train is still um, coming and is on the way. So cost control is a thing, um, especially because in the cloud, it's so important that people worry about their costs. I don't get it why so many people don't really have a good control about their costs when they run on premise, um, which is interesting because um, I know a couple of enterprises who are doing, um, doing public cloud migration and for for some wonder they figure out that it's crazy expensive and then they put other consultancies in place or any cloud cost control company to help them to reuse cloud costs and i'm wondering um why they were not able to do that before and and perhaps they have an idea about their own costs um why these interest and sense for cost of resources is something which is not coming into place if you run on premise or your own infrastructure. Um, so be reasonable. I think um, absolutely in, in a lot of perspective, um, the solutions available on the market make sense um, for, for people, especially when I'm saying you're a startup company, you have an idea would like to start. Of course you go with a software as a service offering, you go with any public cloud and, 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 and try to be 
on the market as soon as possible because you, the market will not wait for you. That makes total sense. Um, but does it really make sense to to put your whole IT you have, which is wherever, if it's like a, a provider somewhere or your own data center, especially if you have um, a base performance you have to deliver. So you don't have like a deployment system where you have to spin up 300 machines and shut them down five minutes later. So just the, the, the basic thing you have to do, which is usually surprisingly cheaper. So what makes sense? So why don't people look for a mix and say, where does it make sense to be um, flexible, for example, in a build environment, because also then a vendor lock-in is not so programmatically, so you can go somewhere else. Um, I think another thing we should take care of that that interoperability is really an important thing um, that we demand from from the vendors we have the companies your enterprises buy services from that we demand a good way to to interact and and combine multiple services and solutions together because then you as a customer have a chance to go from one provider to another from one solution to another from one database to another if you have the chance to work with open data. And surprisingly, most of them, it's super easy to bring data in. It's some way super hard to bring data out. And that's something I think you should demand, especially if you're a big customer of them. We should demand more of that. Prevent vendor lock-in. Um, again, like I said before, I know a lot of people say this is not an argument anymore because preventing this costs you speed on the market and um, you, you, you cannot afford it. I think it's still, it's still an argument, perhaps not for everyone, but definitely I would like to bring it up because for me it is. The var variety is the thing, which I'm really worried about a little bit that we, which makes the internet and as you see the IT landscape when, when, when we work together with data, which is like transferred over the world, um, the variety that big vendors, smaller shops, everybody in some way has access. And the same thing is true for, for software developers is that variety is, is really one of the superpowers. We, we won with um, open standards. We won with a lot of open source and with everyone having a fair access um, to the data highway and having a fair access to, to the resources. And I think this is something we have to take care of that, that, um, that these parts of the industry have a chance to survive. So demand contribution. So if you buy on your cloud provider, so try to figure out if you if they give back, when they use open source tools, which you previously would be perhaps forced to buy an enterprise subscription. So perhaps you can convince them and that they do that as well, that they buy back support. And I know if you have three instances in AWS, they don't give a whatever. Um, but if you have a big company, you can, of course, try to bring this up and and make this up as a topic. Uh, and perhaps it will change in some way. So doubt always if it's if it sounds too good, um, it's always a reason to doubt, especially if somebody is telling you that that this is the only solution. If you don't do it, um, um, there is no chance for you in the future. It's sometimes it's a, it's definitely a reason to to doubt of that's really true. So the diversity is up to you. And uh, it's, it's, I think the diversity is up to all of us because um, we talk about the diversity in our industry a lot, which is, I, I totally know that there's another importance for other diversity, but also from, um, if we don't want to end up in, with three companies controlling um, IT resources and IT traffic and the internet pretty much in some way, um, I think we have to change our behaviors in some way, whoever we is, but otherwise we don't have that diversity and will be super hard for a small shop or for anyone else in that industry to enter it. So I think if we move down that path, it will be super hard for, for a company to go into that internet business um, in, in three to four years from now, because everything is sold and all the fields are, are given away and it's it pretty much will be impossible to have a fair chance to participate in that industry and i think that i'm i'm very about that situation and i'm honestly also worried that in my opinion so many people don't care about it or don't think about it 
Um, but this is what I'm seeing coming coming next to us. Thank you. Um, I hope it had some value for you. Um, and perhaps we have a chance to ask questions and I'm happy to answer it. Um, again, thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions? All right, there's one question in the chat. Which okay. percentage of the costs of a typical company you know is server costs? In other words, to what extent is it costs or getting products to market quickly that drives the, moves, uh, the move to third-party clouds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so one thing is, in, in my opinion, one one big differentiation is, of course, if you make your money um, with IT only or if IT is your business. Um, let's say if you are a bank or let's say if you're building cars um, that's, that are companies I know or you're building parts for, comp uh, your parts for cars, then IT is required in your business because without IT, you cannot do the whole process stuff, but you're not selling IT. Um, another thing is you are, if you're an e-commerce shop and you pretty much don't have your own warehouse, you pretty much just do build a platform, let's say Shopify, that take that as example, for them, the percentage of the server or infrastructure IT costs, let's take like development out of it, has a way other impact. So it's I think it's a big difference between uh, being a producing company of whatever technology or or goods or or pretty much selling a digital product like a streaming provider um, i don't know what percentage the it cost in a traditional producing um, company to, uh, to say but i think that's that's the big difference what i know is i know um, three to three to five companies where I really know that they, for various management reason, for, let's say for every reason, they are forced to go into an all cloud strategy. And um, even if it in some way, and there were a couple of examples where, where it works technically, but cost wise, none of them hit the expectation they had before. Perhaps they were not skilled enough, perhaps they didn't read enough and they're we're not, um, they didn't doubt enough, I don't know, but any of them were totally surprised how crazy expensive that is. Um, and they learned in a hard way that perhaps it would be way smarter to keep some infrastructure on their own and go with a high volatile infrastructure to a cloud provider. Um, this is something I've seen a lot. Um, I don't know if that's true for anyone. Um, so, of course, you you ask others; they have a different story. I know that's not a real one hundred percent answer, um, but I think that's a big difference between how the market works. I guess. All right. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I'll give people a few seconds to type. <laughs> no problem. But it doesn't look like there are any more questions left. All no right. problem. Th thanks for the time. Have a great evening. Thank you for your talk.